You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John is joined today by Professor Adam Frank. Professor Adam Frank received his PhD in physics in 1992 from the University of Washington. In 1995, he was awarded a Hubble Fellowship. He joined the University of Rochester as an assistant professor of physics and astronomy in 1996. He was promoted to associate professor in 2000 and to professor in 2004. Professor Frank's research is in the general area of theoretical astrophysics and in particular, the hydrodynamic and magnetohydrodynamic evolution of matter ejected from stars. He is the author of three books, most recently, Light of the Stars, Alien Worlds, and The Fate of the Earth. Dr. Adam Frank, welcome back to the program. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Now, Doctor, we live in interesting times. Um, one cannot turn on the news without seeing some sort of reference to the UAP phenomenon, <laughs> which is, in my view, as a skeptic, barking up the wrong tree. I know you feel the same way. What is it about this attention that the subject gets that is compelling people? And does it translate over to SETI? Well, I think, you know, UFOs have been around since 1947. I believe that was the first, you know, well-publicized event. And like ghosts, you know, ghost stories, I think, you know, there's something about, you know, once humanity began thinking about life elsewhere, which wholesale, like in popular culture, which really didn't happen until we had rockets that could make it into space, which I think is why starting in 1947, you start seeing this, the UFO phenomena appear. But like ghost stories, they raise the hair on the back of our necks. They're, they're fun to tell. They're spooky. And I, I, I will be very clear that I think you, the UAPs, you know, especially the stuff with the Navy, should be studied. There's enough there to say, look, let's absolutely, using the best tools of science and completely openly, study it. I just, there's nothing in there now. What I'll say is there's nothing in there now that's compelling that you're finding evidence of an alien species that's traveled across interstellar distances and is visiting us and wants to say stay secret, but somehow can't really manage to. That claim is what the problem is. This long history of UFOs being so intriguing to people, I think makes a certain amount of sense once we broke free of the gravity well. Once we were in space, we started imagining possibly of other civilizations being in space. And then it maps on to all this other stuff, the need for salvation, the, the, the destitution of being alone, the wanting to have someone else out there. So there's cultural phenomena. There's a long history of looking towards the stars. And then there, there are some cases that can't be explained, but not being explained doesn't translate into it's alien. But the big problem there is that when dealing with cases that can't be explained, and I agree, and I also believe that people see strange things in the sky. I, I, I do not take issue with the, the idea that people see UFOs. It's just that we don't know what they are. But most of it is anecdotal. And right. in science, you can't do anything on someone's anecdote, someone's right. account, all you can do is say, well, maybe there's something there that we should look into. So within this idea of actually studying the UFO phenomena and identifying the unidentified, should we simply start from scratch and say, the past is the past with UFOs. Let's set up an experiment and try to determine exactly what these are free from any baggage and free from any classification by a government. Absolutely. That is the way you have to do it. Given the amount of coverage that, you know, the, 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 that we have of the planet, that the satellites and radars and such, you could imagine building a program where every airplane has a little UFO detector, so to speak, or a little, little button on it that says, I'm seeing a UFO. It pushes the button. And then the, the, the constellation of Earth observing satellites, et cetera, now swings into view and tries to, in, in as many wavelengths of electromagnetic 
of the electromagnetic spectrum as possible tries to image that. And sometimes maybe they wouldn't, and sometimes it would be covered. And, but yeah, you've got to start from scratch because somebody's story about what they saw, there's just nothing you can do with that scientifically. And we know that personal testimony is often unreliable, right? There's the you know famous examples of this professor who used to every year, he would do this experiment in class where he'd be lecturing and somebody would walk into the class and shoot him and then walk out. And then everyone's horrified, but then you get up and say, okay, all right, everybody write down what you saw. And they all wrote down something different. I mean, it was amazing, the variety. of. So, it's, and again, I would never tell somebody they didn't see something. I'm just saying there's nothing I can do with that. And, you know, what's very interesting here, and, you know, the, the, what's useful potentially here is it can get people to understand how science works. How does science know what it knows? And how does it know what it doesn't know? And people need to understand that if they tried to use the same logic of inference that they're using to make somebody's description of a fuzzy object into an alien, a uh, claim of an alien visitation. You tried to build a cell phone with that. And what you'd end up with there is a brick, you know, a non-functioning cell phone. We have this thing called science. We understand how to enter into a dialogue in the world, how to get answers from the world about things. And that's how we have public knowledge. And you can't, you know, there's no, you know, you have to apply that to every, every question you want public answers about. And so it may be very useful here to show people how we know what we know, how we're able to build this amazing technology, and show them that probably the only way you're going to get answers about life elsewhere in the universe is exactly how you think you're going to do it, is with telescopes, not, not jet finding. Now, it's, it's worth noting here, and in fact, it's actually essential to note it, that science is not inherently anti-alien, quite the opposite, no. because yeah, we like are someone's alien civilization. So chances are, and you work a lot in this within astrobiology, chances are they're out there. The problem is, are they here? And the evidence has not been compelling so far, right? Yeah, right. I mean, there's lots of, you know, as I like to say, there, 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 there's a chain of extraordinary claims that people, you know, that, that, that go into this. And each level of the, of the chain or hierarchy is remarkable. So let's start with like the top level that people want the claim they want to make from the UFOs. And that would be that we are being visited by an advanced alien life form that can cross interstellar space, but somehow can't manage to stay hidden, right? That's the claim they want us to, to believe. But the problem is, is that claim already has, is already built on a bunch of claims that them, each of one of them themselves, it would be so remarkable and extraordinary. So below that, directly below that, is that we're being visited by an advanced alien life that can cross interstellar space. Like the idea that that you could, that anything can cross interstellar space, even an advanced civilization is a remarkable, would require physics and machinery that we don't know it's really possible, right? And then below that is just the claim that there is advanced alien life, right? And then below that is that there's alien life at all. Each one of these claims would be a absolute game changer for science and so jumping right to the top one based on some fuzzy blobs in an infrared camera and a bunch of people saying they saw something, I'm sorry. You just, that's not, that is not how science, that, that they just don't have the weight of evidence, the, um, the, the, the standards of evidence to, to make that claim. Because you know, if I just want to make the claim there's alien life, like even dumb life, microbes, I'm going to need so much high quality data and I'm going to have to face so much skepticism, as I should, right, that it's going to take extraordinary work to be able to prove that claim. And so the idea that you're going to jump all the way up to this top one based on fuzzy blobs and some personal testimony, no way. See, that's, the, I think that's been the problem all along is that the people that are interested in getting to the bottom of these accounts that from the past they don't have quite the same bar. They have the bar of the historian, essentially, as opposed to the bar of the scientist. So while it might, you know, if you were a historian and you were looking into something that may have happened or may not have happened in 1947, you're dealing with a situation where everybody that was witnessing it is dead and all you have is what somebody wrote down. And so all you can really do is come up with some idea of maybe what happened there. That's not science because you can't test that, you can't verify it, you can't do anything with it. Therefore, it is just simply an account. Now, yeah. science needs hard data. And with hard data, we have kind of a problem here 
with what's been coming out lately because those videos, those those gun camera footages are not very good and they are been reproduced and, you know, Mick West has looked into them and said, well, look, this is how a camera's iris works, you know, things like that. So it's just not very good. It's kind of crummy and we need more. But let me ask you this. We've got a UFO report coming out from the federal government later sure. this month. Do you think that they are, <laughs> based on what we know, they seem to be saying, yeah, there's something to this. We don't know what it is. Do you think better data exists that leads them to that conclusion? Or do you just expect this to be a nothing burger? No, I think they're going to say, I, I think, well, whether they have better data or not, whether they'll release the better data. I mean, you know, already it's been leaked, right, that they, they see no evidence, whether they have better, better data or not. They don't have any evidence that it's extraterrestrial, meaning that they, they're they not seeing any evidence that like this thing is moving at Mach 500, stops immediately, you know, so it has, has an acceleration, has a deceleration G-force of 10,000 and then starts up again at 10,000. You know, things that like no known engine could do, no known material could respond to, right? Because how would you how would you validate the claim that something was extraterrestrial? You'd have to see evidence of behavior violating the laws of physics or having capacities that no known engine has or material. So from what's been leaked, they don't see evidence, which means that they don't have data to support that, right? So, but but they are still seeing things that they don't know what what the, what it is. When I did that, when I wrote the op-ed, I did a, a dive into the SIGINT and LINT literature. So signal intelligence and electronic intelligence. And that was fun. Because you know, you've got all these retired military signal intelligence people, and they're they're having a great time. And none of them are like, oh yeah, it's aliens. They're all like, these are peer state adversaries. And you know, they're doing exactly what they should do, is they're baiting our pilots to you know, to turn on their 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 electronic intelligence suites so that they can soak up the radiation and figure out exactly what capacities we have. And that is exactly what we have done in the past. In the I love this, there was a project Palladium in the late 50s, early 60s, when the Russians built this enormous radar. U.S. didn't understand what its capacities were, so they figured out how to fake the Russians into turning the, their radar on so that we could see how strong it was. So that, and, and again, now, is that going to explain everything? I don't know, but certainly that's a more plausible explanation than creatures traveling from across interstellar distances. And then again, this is the part that I really have the most problem with, is like they have unbelievable capacities, but somehow we keep seeing them. Why don't they just let themselves get caught? Or why, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. It just like, it's, it sounds like a science fiction story. Therefore, it is a science fiction story. One thing that strikes me about what you said is that, okay, you've got something that is apparently defying the laws of physics, appearing to do so. And I, it, the thing that occurs to me there is that when you have something that moves that fast across the sky, it starts to sound a lot like what you can do with a searchlight beam, meaning that a beam of light say a decoy, a specialized beam of light, can do all of those things because it's not beholden to right. even the it. speed of light. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and those things, those will all have to be, like, I'm not, as, as Jason Wright likes to say, you know, and others as well, my colleagues, is like, look, you saw something in the sky, you don't know what it is, why are you talking to an astronomer, right? Go talk to an atmospheric physicist. Go talk to an aircraft designer. Go talk to a radar operator or whatever. You know, talk to the experts who would understand this. Why are you talking to an astronomer? I don't, I'm not an expert in those. Like, you know, like, right, exactly what you could do with a beam, a searchlight, or what you could do with balloons. Or the point that the SIG Int guys or community makes is that, look, the things you could do with drones. Yeah, you know, when you think about drones, do not think about the stuff that you get in your hobby store or whatever. Because your state adversary has all kinds of different, you know, drones can be many, many different things that they have plausible explanations for life. But I don't, I mean, I don't, because I, you know, I mean, in terms of immediate plausible explanations, it's not my, right? I'm, my thing is about the connection to aliens and it's just there, the standards of evidence you don't have. So what are they? I don't know. They should be studied, but there's nothing you've seen in the data yet 
that indicate that they're violating the laws of physics. Like you see, like you said, you see things that appear to move this way or that way or faster or it dives under the ocean and then comes back up or whatever. But as McWest has shown, you know, there's a lot that you can explain just by the camera movements or the optics of the camera. So all that has to be exhaustively studied. And what I'm going to bet is that you will end up with 95% of them being explainable and 5% still being like, look, I just don't have the data. But also, as you said, what you really need is to start from scratch and just do an earth observing program that could when you see new ones let's try and get quality data now i want to bring up a fundamental problem that hasn't been discussed very much as at least as far as i can tell you are the originator of the silurian hypothesis the idea that earth renews its surface so much that there could have been a prior technological civilization here as as jason Wright put it that we wouldn't even know about now given that you have that doesn't that mean that you could never actually even nail down if you found something alien or what appeared to be alien, an artifact or something like that in the solar system, you may not be able to establish if it actually is or if it was prior Earth life. I mean, yeah. they're both almost equivalent, right? Or maybe even the, the yeah. Earth explanation is more likely. Views on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I remember, though, that when we when when Gavin Schmidt and I, proposed this. And it was really Gavin's idea that when he, he and I were talking, he said, uh, you know, we, I started this conversation thinking about, you know, alien Anthropocenes, alien climate change. He said, well, why even think about alien, you know, alien civilizations ending because of climate change, maybe Earth civilizations. We weren't saying that it happened. We weren't saying there was a previous civilization. What we were really just pointing out, you know, it was a pure science point of like, you can't make the claim that there's never been another intelligent civilization because you wouldn't know. You wouldn't see any record of it. That's all we were saying. There is no way. I, I don't believe there was a previous Earth, Earth civilization. All we were saying was like, if you want to answer that question, you kind of don't have the data to make the claim that there wasn't. But as you point out, if you found something floating around in the solar system, yeah, you'd have to, you know, there's probably ways you might be able to tell that though, by looking at chemical compounds, let's say you find an artifact, right? And you're able to diagnose it, you know, pull it apart, and you can do mass spectrometry of it. You would be able to see whether or not it had the, the uh, isotopic abundances that were, that you'd expect for something in the solar system, as opposed to something that may have originated from a different cloud in the universe. So you could probably, you could probably go somewhere in terms of telling a difference between a previous, uh, an artifact from a previous Earth civilization versus one that came from a, di uh, a distant star. It's an interesting thing to think about. You, you run into the, the, the same problem, though. The aliens of the gaps. Aliens can do anything. And if they can do anything, then they can fake their isotopes or make you believe whatever. <laughs> so the true. point is... They do the, that. Like, why? I mean, then you have to come up with... And that's always, you know, the problem when whenever you're dealing with, with UFOs and stuff, you end up with these questions about alien motivation. And I just think that you just can't go there, right? You have no... Who knows what an alien mind is like? So I don't, you know, I mean... I think you just, if, if I were to find some, if I were to find an artifact on the moon and it had the exact abundances that I would expect for something that was mined on the earth, then that's as far as I would go. Because I can't say why, I mean, there's just, there's, there's, again, when you talk about, you know, what I can do with science, uh, I can, I can always invent a more complicated story, but kind of by Occam's razor, you go with a story that, that, that has the fewest number of assumptions. So in this case, in that context, Distance is a good thing. So if you pick up a radio signal or a techno signature from 10 light years away, it's so distant that it probably has nothing to do with life on your planet, right? So in this case, yeah. distance is good. Yeah, 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 right. That would that would be an indicator of, of just that. There. Again, unless there'd be no reason to assume that the life from that, that you're, you know, the signal that you're picking up had anything to do with your, the, the life that originated on this planet. Now let's talk about abundances and move towards some of your recent work here. If you had an alien civilization with you inside your own atmosphere, that would indicate that alien civilizations are beyond ubiquitous and there are many, many of them. So is that correct? I mean, statistically speaking, uh, that would generally no, tend towards that, right? No, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't conclude that. I mean, if, if, there, if I saw... If I had indications, if I had proof that there was a, an, an alien civilization visiting us or an artifact from alien, all I could really conclude was that there was one more, right? 
Now, you can infer from that, now that you've got two examples of life in the universe and intelligent civilizations, it makes it easier to argue that there's lots of them, but that, that, that doesn't follow for sure. It could be that there are only two, and these guys found us because they were, you know, they were so lonely. <laughs> so, yeah, you couldn't necessarily infer that they're everywhere. This gets into a recent paper you co-authored with Jason Wright and, and colleagues about the dynamics of the transition between Kardashev Type 2 and Type 3 civilizations and where you should look in a galaxy for technosignatures. And it seems to favor central regions of galaxies. Now, this has always been an area of galaxies that people said, maybe not too much radiation, too many closely packed stars. What's different here? Well, the difference is we're not talking about biogenesis, right? So the, the question about whether or not you can form life in situ, as they say, versus life traveling there, those are that's, that's what separates them out. It may be difficult to form life in the galactic bulge in the center because of too much radiation, et cetera, or, or supernovas going off. But the idea of, of forming or of traveling there and, and setting up, you know, settlements well, if you're advanced enough, you can protect against radiation. And we also have one thing we found is that when we did these models and we included things like supernova sterilization bubbles, that, you know, after a while they, they fill in, you know, because you know, if, you, if you have a region that has lots of civilizations and a supernova goes off and it sterilizes everybody, okay, that kills everybody. But in another 10 million, 100 million years, that supernova is gone and that could be resettled. So those bubbles always get, end up getting filled in. Now, as the universe ages, and resources become an issue when yeah. does is it doesn't it seem more natural to move towards denser areas of matter in general so that you can use it as opposed to intergalactic space well i mean intergalactic space is empty for sure so yeah you're not going to be there but the question is where would you want to where do you think it would be in the galaxy and the interesting thing about galaxies is the density of stars decreases with distance from the center um, and what that's important for, it's not just resources, it's also, I mean, because our models, we tried to include the physics of the travel. So, you know, all our, our, our century ships, or whatever you want to call them, you know, we just call them probes, but our settlement ships move at like a tenth of the speed of light. Uh, and they also have a finite range, right? I mean, you know, it's a machine. They're not going to last forever. So they can only, you know, that's one of the parameters we could play with was how far could they get? So we tried a bunch of different parameters. But let's say you choose 10 light years or 100 light years. Well, then what that means is, is that you can only make a hop of 10 to 100 light years. And as you get farther out in the galaxy, the stars are spaced so far apart that that's too far for the spaceship to travel, for your settlement ship to travel. So that is one of the reasons why you get very rapid settlement of the inner part of the galaxy, because everything is so close that it's a real quick, easy hop. Uh, whereas the stuff in the outer parts of the galaxy Things are, as they say, the outer rim, right? How many science fiction stories have the outer rim of the galaxy, the, wi the wild west of the outer rim? There's just fewer stars and they're further, further apart. Now, where are we in this scheme? I mean, we know where we're located in the galaxy, but are we in an area where you could reasonably expect to see other colonizing species or are we on, in sort of the boondocks? We are, we are eight kiloparsecs, 8,000 parsecs away from the center. So galaxy is about 30,000, has a radius of about 30,000 parsecs. So we're about a third of the way out, if I have that right. And somebody can correct me if I have that wrong. Sometimes I do stupid things like that. So we're not at the center, but we're not at the edge either. So we're in a kind of in-between range. And so what's, one of the things that's interesting when we ran these models so it really, it does, you know, the, the, depending on the, your technology, depending on the capacities of your spaceships, how fast they can travel, how long they can travel, that determines sort of where the transition between hard to settle and easy to settle parts of the galaxy are. And what we found is that we were kind of, the, the location of the Earth may be just at the place where you're in between easy and hard to settle. And of course, you know, we don't know what the technologies there are. We chose a you know, reasonable, what is a reasonable value? But we chose things like, you know, I think 10 light years, that you could travel 10 light years, a hop was 10 light years, and 10th and, and of the speed of light, which are both would be amazing technologies for us. We can't, we can barely even imagine how to make that happen. You know, so that's people, that's people need to understand that. When it comes to like sending things across the stars, our best model, our best idea for sending things across the stars has been to like develop something that you could drop nuclear bombs behind 
and push it forward. That's how crude basically our idea of interstellar travel is. It's just like set off a bunch of bombs behind your ship and to push you along. So yeah, so like the, the technology of you know being able to go a tenth of the speed of light and travel for 10 light years would itself be remarkable technologies. But it did seem, as I said, we did seem like we were, you know, depend for, for what seemed like reasonable values, we were at somewhere around that transition between easy and hard to settle. How good of a techno signature is someone dropping nuclear bombs out the back of their ship? Would you see that at a distance? I have not done the calculation. I don't know. I would imagine that it would be pretty, uh, you know, it might be a reasonable, yeah, it might be a reasonable techno signature. The question is, I, I never looked at this in detail. How do you, uh, you may only need to light, off, light the bombs off while you're accelerating up to your speed and then decelerate. So it may be that you're not continually lighting them off. You just need to get up to speed and then occasionally light one off to deal with the, the drag. But uh, yeah, so. I am officially ruling out my participation in space travel by nuclear bomb. I do yeah. not want to be dependent on hydrogen bombs in order to yeah. slow down. Yeah. No, no, it, just, it shows you. That was, that was an idea that came up a while ago. Now, people, there is the discussion of using giant phased array lasers to power interstellar sails. That's a possibility, too, which is much more... But the problem with that one is there's no way of slowing down. You can launch one but it's not clear how you, unless you, have, unless you already have a laser at where you want to go, you just zip by it at relativistic speeds. So that poses a problem. But that is, and it's not clear if that would even work, but uh, that is a cool idea. The idea of using phased laser, giant lasers to push interstellar sails. At, at you know, if, you, if you just want to get some pictures and do a flyby though, I mean. Well, exactly. And that's what Starshot, that's what Breakthrough Starshot is all about. They, they, you know, breakthrough, the Breakthrough Institute gave a uh, hundred million dollars to like at least start trying to think about the technologies that would be involved with that. Some people laugh at that. I think that's a, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a cool idea. I don't know if it'll be possible, but it certainly is worth pursuing because it's better than nuclear bombs. <laughs> well, that, and I mean, just think of the, the value to humanity of the idea of one thing that's always interested me as an amateur astronomer is imaging disks of stars, which yeah. there is only a handful of those that we can do that with, you know, Beetlejuice and such. But to actually get a picture close enough to another star, say a red dwarf like Proxima Centauri, that is, would be one of the greatest achievements of humanity to date. I mean, it's hard to understate that, that the image of another star and actually being able to see a flare or something like that is absolutely astounding and makes it worthwhile in and of itself, don't you think? Well, even better would be to zoom by a planet. If you had an exoplanet that you found that you thought was really interesting, the idea of, for a breakthrough star shot is that you would launch, uh, using these lasers, lots of, te lots of teeny tiny micro ships that were basically cell phone sized devices on, with, with uh, sails, and you'd shoot a bunch of them at, the, you could get them up to hopefully very close to light speed. So it would take only four years, five years to get to Proxima Centauri. And they would zip by, but they would take images and send them back. And that, man, I, well, that's what I want. I want an image of a, of a exo, of a, you know, alien world that, you know, from, from nearby. That would be super cool. It would indeed. And then <laughs> let's look at its atmosphere. Let's start characterizing atmospheres yeah. and trying to figure out the big question of whether life itself the beginnings of life itself are common or not in this universe. I think that they're very common. I'll bet there's microbes everywhere. But I'm not so convinced about civilizations. No, it's hard. I mean, it's, you know, what's amazing is we all have opinions about it. Me too. I, th I kind of agree. Well, I, I mean, I certainly agree about microbes. I don't know about advanced life. I mean, it's just, but yeah, really, we just don't know because we're just, we're just carrying a giant bag of biases with us. And uh, the only way to know is to look. The only way is to know. We, we could be surprised. It could be that it's very, very, very rare. Or it's going to be all over the place. I mean, we just don't know. And it's such an interesting and frustrating time to live because for all of human history, people have been arguing about this in one form or another. And now we are just about to get data relevant to answers. And I'm 58. And there's a good shot I'll be dead before the answers come. But, you know, the answers can come like, you know, another 20, 30 years after uh, I die. Or, you know, maybe I'll be around. But the thing is, it's just like, 
we're, you know, we're on the verge of knowing. And it's just so weird to be in this moment when we don't know. Because look, uh, if you talked to me 30 years ago and asked me about other planets, or, you know, are, are planets common or rare? I'd be like, well, I don't know. Here's the argument. You know. And then suddenly the answer, we, we do the answer. Like we made this transition where we knew, oh yeah, planets all over the place, all kinds of planets. And so there was a moment when you didn't know, and then there was a moment when you knew, and that same thing is going to happen. And right now we don't know. With life and intelligence, we just don't know. And at some point, we're going to know. That's actually one of the high points of my activities as an amateur astronomer over the last 30 plus years. I remember a time we weren't sure there, whether there were planets or not. You'd read in Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine that, well, maybe, maybe. But then you also had scientists that said they got to be common at the time. And they turned out to be correct because there just simply was no reason why there wouldn't be. Well, there had, but the thing, interesting thing is you know, when I wrote the book, The Light of the Stars, my last book, I looked into the history of this and there was a long period when people were sure that planets were unco- were rare, very rare, because it was James Jeans had developed, you know, nobody knew how planets formed. They didn't, they, nobody had seen disks around other stars. So the idea was that planets formed when two stars passed close enough to each other to sort of gravitationally pull material out that then went into orbit around one of the stars. And genes calculated that those those collisions were very, very, very rare. So from 1890 to 1960, people were pretty sure that planets were rare. So it just goes to show you that I mean that you can you can have you can have a community think something is impossible and then they you know it turns out that they were all wrong. I should note again your last book, Light of the Stars, Alien Worlds and the Fate of Earth is an exploration into these topics. So people should check that out on Amazon. Now did you in your recent paper with Wright and colleagues, did you think about maybe the nature of alien civilizations that are colonizing a galaxy? For example, would a biological civilization like us behave differently from a machine civilization, specifically in that maybe is the galactic center a little bit too warm for a machine civilization seeking efficient calculations? I mean, did you guys think about that or is that just too speculative? That's too speculative. Yeah, like, you know, the the interesting thing about this game, if we're going to play this game scientifically, we've got to ask, where do we have, you know, where do we have guardrails? You know, where does science give us, I always like to use the analogy of when you were a kid and you went bowling and there were those gutter bumpers that came up that kept you from throwing the ball into the gutter because you were a little kid and you couldn't, you know, the ball was so heavy. So when we're thinking about this, if we want to avoid just wild speculation, which anybody can do, you know, if, again, if you want to, if you don't want to write science fiction stories, you got to turn to science and ask you, where does science provide some constraints on your imagination? And so we've got the laws of physics, we've got the laws of chemistry. We have some things about biology that I think are going to be that you can use, like Darwinian evolution. Is I, I don't think. I think Darwinian evolution is a good bet to work anywhere because it's just sort of, there's a sort of foundational logic that doesn't have anything to do with the particulars of how it worked out here. Population biology, mathematical, you know, life is going to have to eat uh, and reproduce for it to be life. So, you know, population biology may have some things that are common. But after that, I don't think you got a lot. I don't think there's a lot you can do. So I don't think you can really play those games scientifically and ask, well, what if they were like this? Or what if they were like that? Because really, like I said, you know, alien minds, how do we even begin to consider what alien minds are like? They may not have math at all, right? The, the way we think of it. They may not have the sense of individuality uh, that we do. So it's just, I think it's really hard to sort of ask about alien intention and agency. So as much as fun as I don't mind, like, you know, thinking about it, but I don't think I can include it in my science. The one thing you can do is look for techno signatures because there you're just looking for whatever, (laughs) you know, you're you're trying to see anything that could be artificially produced. Now, tell us about your work in techno signatures and the grant. Yeah. So what you can do is you can just look for the ways in which civilization, which you use. So this is where like, right, the idea of constraints, right? Any civilization on some level is an engine. It's an engine for harvesting energy and using that energy to do work, to make their civilization. So if it's an industrial civilization, if it's a technological civilization, then it's hoovering up energy and resources and it's making things with them. That's the whole idea of technology. So you can look for the unintentional consequences or the unintentional markers 
of that activity. And by unintentional, I mean, this is different from saying somebody's sending you a signal. Somebody's put up a beacon so that other civilizations will find them. I'm not sure anybody would want to do that. But on the other hand, using, if you need to harvest energy, there's only a num certain number of ways of doing it. And one good way would be to harvest solar energy using solar voltaics. And there's only a certain number of kinds of materials you can use to do that. And so, for example, if somebody were to cover their moon or a moon or a planet with solar panels, that changes how the reflected light from that planet would look. There would be an imprint, a signature of those solar panels in the reflected light. So that is a possible techno signature. Another pot that you could look for, you could look at distant planets and look for this signature. If you knew exactly what to look for in terms of what wavelength to look at, you could look for that signature. We just published a paper, or not, we just finished a paper and submitted it, where we looked at the production of, or the uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. These are the in, these are the industrial chemicals that human beings used in spray cans, etc., and in refrigerants. And this is a chemical that, like, there is just no way that nature would produce this on its own. And so we looked at CFCs as a techno signature. Would you be able to detect CFCs in an atmosphere? at the level that Earth has now, or 10 times the level that Earth has now, or 100 times the Earth has now. And what we found is, is that even with the JWST, the next space telescope that's going up next year, you would be able to detect Earth-level CFCs in a planet that was not too far away. And that's remarkable. That We were showing that you could detect Earth levels of technology using Earth observing technology we have right now, not something pie in the sky that's three, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years away. So there's a whole list of things like this that you can look for. But before you look for them, you have to know exactly what you're looking for and how to look for it. And that is what, that's the phase that we're at now with techno signatures. We're just beginning this process of identifying what are possible techno signatures and characterizing them in a way that once people begin to take data with James W, with the, J, the JWST and other new telescopes, they'll know what to look for. Now, it's worth noting that essentially we're talking about with CFCs, we're talking about Freon or what yeah. used to be called Freon, the, the old stuff that caused ozone holes and things like that. So what can you infer if you find that? I mean, if you see trace amounts in an exoplanet atmosphere of that artificial chemical, I mean, what can you say from that? I mean, can you say they have air conditioning or you, you can say they're careless and that they're in a stage where they're doing it. But if they have a whole lot of it, as I recall, CFCs are really good greenhouse gases. Could you infer that? That's exactly, that that's exactly. So the, first off, all what I can conclude, what's most important is there's a civilization there. You know, there's an industrial civilization. I have no idea, and to zeroth order, I have no idea what they're doing with it. You know, maybe they just like the smell of it. But what matters is that there's an industrial civilization there. That would be the most important conclusion that you could make. But one of the things we found from our own work was that, yeah, that actually... This is a great gas for terraforming. If you have a planet that like, you know, is a little too cold and you need to warm it up so that you can have liquid water on the surface, dump a lot of CFCs into it, into the atmosphere. So that could be that CFCs may be an excellent tracer for if you see it in really high amounts that this is a planet that's being terraformed. What of some situations, let's write some science fiction novels, but not quite so crazy. If you started looking at that, and you saw one instance of it, and then you started looking around at surrounding star systems, and you saw more CFCs in other atmospheres, you could conclude that you have a very advanced terraforming civilization, right? That's been proposed, you know, that's one of been one of the things proposed as a techno signature. What if I, I you know, forget even about CFCs, what if I observe a system, you know, like there's a Trappist system, right, which has got a whole bunch of planets in the uh, habitable zone. And what if I look at those and I see identical conditions. I see planets that have the identical temperatures, identical atmospheric compositions. That would be really weird. That would tell me that, yeah, probably I've got, I've got a civilization there that has changed its planetary architecture or changed, changed those planets to, to all match whatever they wanted, which is exactly what we would do with Mars and Venus and come back in 10,000 years to the solar system. And you might find that Mars and Venus have been terraformed to look exactly like the Earth. Which brings up an idea that I've thought about a lot the impossible planet 
Mars with a thick atmosphere that it shouldn't have, (laughs) showing obvious signatures of having been terraformed. Now, if that's maintained long term, millions of years, maybe, we don't know how long civilizations last, then you've got a good case, even without CFCs, right? I mean, say the terraforming is done and you remove the gases and you just have a planet that's too small to have the atmosphere it should for its right. inferred age, that in itself is a techno signature, right? It could be, yeah. I mean, of course, what would have, you know, people would push back and say, well, how do you know that that planet couldn't hold on? I mean, you know, but again, yes. So you'd have to, you'd have to exhaust, if that was the only thing you had, some people may say like, well, maybe we don't understand atmospheric loss well enough that this could be a natural phenomena. But that's exactly the kind of thing you have to show. You'd have to, you'd have to eliminate the alternative scenarios, the natural scenario. Now, ambiguity with technosignatures is a problem because you can look at something and see something that looks clearly technological, such as the wow signal, and then it gets ambiguous because you never see it again. How do you weed through those sort of instances? Are are they just things to be discarded until you actually have something that's unambiguous? Or should we be open to the possibility that technosignatures might be more transient than we might have expected? Well, the kind of techno signatures we just talked about would not be transient. That's what's nice about them, right? I mean, if there's CFCs in the atmosphere, they're going to be in the atmosphere now, and they're going to be in the atmosphere next week, right? So that's why, in general, I am a big fan of this kind of approach. This I call it metabolic techno signatures because they come from the metabolism, so to speak, of the civilization. Because those won't be transient; they'll always be there. You know, anything that's transient, there's nothing you can do about it. If you only see it once, you're not, there's nothing you can do with it. All you can do is say, "Oh." So, the, you know, in general, uh, if you don't see multiple examples of uh, a certain kind of signature and you only see it once, it's just like with the UFOs. It's not science. What about heat? Speaking of, of the, metabolic, um, <laughs> the metabolism of a civilization, the more advanced you get, the more waste heat you're going to produce, right? So if you're using energy, you're going to produce heat. So what techno signatures could we look at regarding a planetary civilization producing a whole lot of heat? and trying to get rid of it. Well, if you could, you know, if you, once, once you get large enough telescopes, you do have the possibility of mapping, you know, even in a very crude way, uh, exoplanet surfaces by doing like, you know, what they call tomography and such. And you might see heat islands. You might see regions of the planet that are due to industrial activity that are, that are showing heat. So that's a real possibility. Global warming itself, people have talked about, I've talked about, but I'm not sure if you could really unambiguously tell whether or not a planet was warmer than it should be without seeing other things happen. But if you had something in space, say a, a Dyson swarm radiating heat, is that better? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. That would be, you know, I mean, uh, you'd have to be able to ensure that the, you know, heat is a blunt instrument because a space station at 400 degrees and a rock at 400 degrees uh, emit the exact same heat signature black body radiation, right? So that, that's what makes it a little difficult. So you're going to need more than just the heat signature itself. You're going to need some other things along with it that could show you that it's not just a rock. To sort of tie this back to the beginning, the UFOs. All right. So within the list of potential technos, techno signatures, we also have close ones. Well, I know that uh, James Benford's uh, tossed out the idea of, of passing star systems, encounters with other stars, and somebody that might inhabit that star system passing through the Oort cloud millions of years ago might have placed a probe here saying, well, there's an interesting exoplanet right there. Oh, Maybe perfect. something. They might have done that. Or there's the the full-on Avi Loeb, Umuamua stuff that maybe it was a light sail passing through. Or just John von Neumann, these probes settling the galaxy and self-replicating and just not really too worried if it takes a million or two million or three million years to do so. The moment you have a piece of alien technology in your solar system opens up the possibility of a UFO presence, right? I mean, is that a plausible way? Well, yeah, I know that's, you know, that's the one way I could see UFOs, U- UAPs being plausible, is that this is stuff that somebody's thrown at. You know, the Earth has been recognizable, has had recognizable biosignatures for billions of years. And maybe people have thrown stuff at us to be able to, you know, to, to watch. So, I mean, it's absolutely worth 
studying the solar system, to uh, looking around the solar system to look for lurkers, as they say. I consider that to be a much longer shot than than the other things, but it's absolutely worth, just like it's worth studying the UFO, UAPs, UFOs, it's absolutely, we should be also looking at solar system artifacts as well, which is mind-blowing, right? It's mind-blowing. The whole that. thing is mind-blowing, and we live in a time where we can actually do it. This isn't isn't something that that is outside of our capabilities. There's a very real chance that we, you could wake up one day and the Allen telescope array has picked up a signal <laughs> or it, you've seen a Dyson swarm or something like that. This could happen in right. in this time that we live, which yeah. is yeah. unbelievably no, crazy. Yeah. Even without the UFOs, even without an alien origin oh, of the UFOs. That, that's, it's a pretty amazing moment that we live in. That's people should understand, like forget the UFOs. There's We're already living in a at a remarkable moment in thinking about life in the universe. All right, we are out of time. Everybody should check out Light of the Stars, Alien Worlds, and the Fate of the Earth by Adam Frank at uh, Amazon or a uh, bookseller near you. And thanks again, Dr. Frank, for appearing with us. Oh, it was a great pleasure. Anna, I have a surprise for you. Is it another rock, John? A rock? No, introducing Annabot. So I am Annabot. Oh, well, that didn't work. Oh, points for effort, though. Indeed. So, what's for dinner? Spaghetti, John. <laughs>